So I'm going to go through the latest fiscal numbers, talk about um, the Conservative Party manifesto commitments, um, and what the trade-offs are for the Chancellor as he moves towards his um, budget um, in the autumn. Now, the big picture to all of what's going on in the public finances has been the terrible economic performance that the UK has had since 2008. Um, line here shows you GDP per person age 16 and over. You can see that it's now only just above the level that we were enjoying at the start of 2008. And if I'd stood here at the start of 2008 and made a forecast, maybe a very simple one you might have done was to say, well, let's assume that GDP per capita is going to grow at about 2% per year. Um, if it had, we'd have been on that trajectory of the black line, um, and we are today about 15% poorer on average than what we may well have expected. And also disappointingly, the gap between the two is forecast to widen. So it's not the case that we're 15% poorer, but it's a temporary hit and we think we're going to bounce back. If anything, that gap is growing and it climbs to about 18% by the forecast horizon. So terrible economic performance, putting incredible strain on the finances of many households, also putting incredible strain um, on the finances of the government. So the government has some fiscal targets. Um, the last set we had were announced by Philip Hammond in his first fiscal statement, the autumn statement of 2016. These fiscal targets were replacing those that had only been introduced a year before. So we've been going through fiscal targets at quite a rapid rate. There were four of them. Um, the top three were all on course to be met with some wiggle room. Um, the most challenging one was the bottom one, to deliver a headline surplus as soon as possible in the next parliament. Now, presumably at the time, the Chancellor was thinking about a parliament that would run from 2020 to 2025. Um, as we pointed out at the time, an early election would make that target much harder to meet because you'd be getting, having to get to a surplus sooner. The Conservative Party manifesto only mentions one fiscal target, and that is to have a balanced budget by the middle of the next decade. So it's a softening on the headline surplus as soon as possible in what would be the current parliament. And in fact, even the 2025 seems to be a bit vaguer with the looser middle of the next decade. So I'm going to go through lots of fiscal numbers. It's important to remember that when we're talking about forecasts, they're all uncertain. They will all be wrong. Um, Therefore, we need to bear that in mind when we're making policy decisions, when we're looking at um, costings of policies, for example. So this shows you what the coalition government um, was forecasting for the deficit back in March 2015, the last budget before the 2015 election. At the time, George Osborne was forecast, well, the deficit had fallen sharply since 2009-10, and Mr. Osborne was forecasting a surplus in 2018-19. If we roll forward a year, so the first budget of the Conservative government, you can see that the date at which we were forecasting a budget surplus had been pushed back to 2019-20. The Conservatives, after the 2015 election, um, decided to go for spending plans that were more generous than the ones that they'd committed to in their manifesto. They also then chose to row back on the tax credit cuts that they'd announced in their first budget, but still getting to budget surplus um, by the end of the current decade. We then roll forward to Mr Hammond's first budget, the most recent budget, last March, and you can see that um, the downgrade in the economic forecasts, in part related to Brexit, but not entirely, meant that the forecast now implied the deficit persisting throughout the forecast period, so falling through to 2019-20 and then being pretty stable um, thereafter. So it was pretty clear from this that if you wanted to get to balanced budget, there'd be more work to do. And the OBR also provides a split of the estimates for the deficit into the structural deficit and the cyclical deficit. So the cyclical deficit is the bit that they think is explained by temporary weakness in the economy. We can sit back and relax about that. It should disappear as growth um, does its work. The structural deficit is more problematic. It's not explained by temporary weakness in the economy. If you want to reduce that, you're talking about having to do tax rises or spending cuts. And rather disappointingly, we're now in a position where the OBR is judging that all of the deficit is structural, not cyclical. So the deficit is, is entirely explained by um, a permanent phenomena, and therefore if you want to reduce it further, it's tax rises or spending cuts, um, or in other words, austerity that would be needed. The Chancellor, um, at least prior to the election, had this 2% of GDP limit on the structural deficit in 2020-21, and you can see here that there was quite a bit of wiggle room against that target at the time. So all of that borrowing that we've done over recent um, years, over the last decade, have added considerably to public sector net debt. 
Um, it was running below 40% of GDP prior to the financial crisis. It's now above 80% of GDP, forecast to rise slightly over the next year or so before falling. And you can see it's falling in 2020. So again, that chan the Chancellor's target of having debt fall in that year um, is on course to be met. In part, it's due to some accounting issues with the um, loans made out by the Bank of England. Um, in particular, as a result of the referendum, the Bank of England decided to lend some money to the financial sector on a two-year basis. When those loans are made, it adds to public sector net debt. When, touch wood, the financial sector repays those loans in two years' time, it will mean public sector net debt falling. So if you strip that effect out, you can see that the decline in debt is actually much more gradual. So the headline figures are flattered by this, and it makes the Chancellor's target easier to meet. And where does that leave us in terms of the big picture for tax and spend? Well, the, the dark green hit line here shows you public spending as a share of the economy. The lighter green, um, which is typically below it, shows you tax receipts and non-tax receipts as a share of the economy. You can see that the financial crisis led to tax receipts dipping down a little bit as a share of GDP, but a larger part of the story was public spending growing very, very sharply. That wasn't really because we were spending loads more in cash terms on public spending. It was rather it was because we kept to the cash spending limits for things like schools and hospitals. Those were set out prior to the crisis and were predicated on a certain level of economic growth. When the economy underperformed, those same spending plans turned out to be a much larger share of our smaller than expected economy. Since then, you can see that the tax burden has been edging up over time, and you can see that the government has cut public spending as a share of GDP quite considerably. The gap between the two, the deficit, um, is now back to the level it was at in 2007-8. So the austerity that we've had in two, since 2010 has been sufficient to get the deficit back to pre-crisis levels. And it's done it in a way which has left the tax burden a bit higher than what it was prior to the crisis and public spending a little higher than what it was prior to the crisis. So we're now in a world where we're spending a bit more and taxing a bit more as a share of our economy than we were in 2007-8, and borrowing a similar sum, albeit with a much larger amount of debt that's been accumulated. Going forwards, the plans imply the tax burden continuing to edge up and public spending continuing to be cut as a share of GDP. Um, if delivered, it means that the Public spending will be brought back down to its lowest level as a share of the economy since 2003-04. So it's nothing like the situation three years ago where the forecasts were implying public spending falling to its lowest share of the economy since the 1920s. And the tax burden will rise, reaching its highest level since 1986-87. So that's if the forecasts are correct, that's how the remaining deficit reduction, at least through the rest of this parliament, um, would come from. Turning that to that in a bit more detail, why is the tax burden rising? Well, in part, in large part, it's been driven by some discretionary policy decisions, some decisions to push up taxes. In particular, dividend tax was put up by Philip Hammond, and council tax is set to rise, um, with those increases earmarked for additional spending on social care. It's worth noting there are also tax cuts going on, but that's the net figure, so there are big tax rises um, offset partially by tax cuts. One of those tax cuts is to corporation tax. Um, it's currently 19%. Um, by 2020, it's set to fall to 17%. If, for example, the Chancellor decided not to go ahead with that planned cut to corporation tax, he would boost forecast revenues by about £5 billion a year, at least in the near term. On the other hand, the forecasts assume that every April will increase fuel duty rates in line with the RPI. Um, it's quite traditional in the UK to think that's going to happen until you get to a budget and then you cancel this year's increase. Um, if we think that behaviour is going to continue, and I noticed that Lord Lawson was on the radio last week arguing it should not, um, but if it were to continue by 21-22, that would cost the public finances about £4 billion in that year. The Conservative Party manifesto had some, a recommitment to some further income tax cuts. Um, they continued with the pledge from their previous manifesto to have a £12,500 personal allowance, which is supported by the DUP, and a £50,000 higher rate threshold by 2020. They're not on the books. If we do decide to do both of those, it will cut taxes by about £2 billion. On the spending side, in part, the spending cuts as a share of GDP are being driven by benefit cuts working their way through the pipeline. So we have two more years of the benefits freeze, the nominees to most rates of working age benefits to come, next April and the following April. And in addition, some of the benefit cuts that are already in place 
are having increasing impact over time. So as new, new claimants move on to universal credit, they'll find that on average universal credit is now less generous than the system that it replaces. As people who've got two or more children have more children, they'll find that their um, benefits will not go up as much as what they would have done um, under the pre-April 2017 um, system. And by 21-22, the combined effect of that will be to reduce public spending by about £11 billion, and actually those savings will grow over the longer term. There were some Conservative Party manifesto commitments to cut back on benefit spending for pensioners. Um, they wouldn't have saved very much in the current Parliament anyway, um, but both have been um, abandoned. And finally, on public services, if we look at total public spending outside of debt interest, outside of benefits, so what we might broadly think of as public service spending, that's actually planned to increase over the next five years by £37 billion. But of course, the economy is forecast to grow over this period, and that magnitude of real increase actually represents a cut to the share of national income being devoted to public services, a cut that's equivalent to about £17 billion. But it's worth noting that that 17 billion is not uniform. Um, so for example, it comprises a 27 billion pound cut to day-to-day -day spending on public services as a share of national income, alongside a 10 billion pound boost to investment spending as a share of national income as a result of Philip Hammond's autumn statement decision to increase investment spending plans. There were some commitments in the manifesto that the Conservatives published on schools, on the NHS, and on social care. Um, but our judgment was that essentially, given the real increases that were implied by the budget forecast, that those commitments that they made in the manifesto didn't really um, require additional funding over and above what had already been set aside. It wasn't obvious to us you would have to top up the spending plans in the budget in order to keep to the commitments they made for extra spending, at least, in those areas. Now, as we, if we do want to continue deficit reduction and we do want to eliminate the deficit, it's worth noting there are some additional pressures on the public finances. Um, the most <coughs> obvious one, perhaps, for public spending is that the population is growing in size, it's also ageing, and also history suggests that healthcare costs will rise over time. And if we look over the period from 2021 to 2025, the OBR numbers suggest that this ageing of the population is putting a particular pressure on the public finances. That's a five-year period in which we're not planning to increase the state pension age. It's going to be age 66 for both men and women throughout that period. It's also a period in which the baby boomers, born in the late 40s, early 50s, will be putting increasing pressures on the NHS and social care budgets. There's also a potential pressure on receipts from immigration. Um, in the autumn statement, the OBR reduced its um, forecast for immigration into the UK relative to what it would have done absent the referendum result. And because of that, they reduced their forecast for tax receipts by about £6 billion per year. The Conservative Party manifesto contains a commitment to reduce net immigration to tens of thousands. If the OBR were to incorporate that into their forecast, it would be a similar size reduction in um, forecast immigration. Um, and you might therefore expect them to downgrade their revenue forecast by a similar magnitude. And I don't think any public finance talk at the moment would be complete without a discussion of the issues around Brexit. Um, economists are pretty much agreed that um, leaving the European Union, leaving the single market will be bad for the UK economy and bad for the public finances. What economists are not agreed on is the size of that impact. Um, there's a large range of estimates. Um, what we do know, of course, is that if we increase tariff and non-tariff barriers with countries with which we trade, that will reduce economic growth and therefore it will weaken the public finances. So the most public finance friendly Brexit will be the one where tariff and non-tariff barriers are not increased too much. It's worth noting that the OBR of course have incorporated um, the estimated, estimated impact of Brexit on the public finance into their forecasts and their forecasts run to 21-22. And I think it's worth noting there that the hit to GDP that we're getting over that period is very heavily on the investment side. So it's a reduction in investment that we're seeing relative to the pre-referendum forecast. Now, when you reduce investment spending in the economy, of course, that will only have a mooted effect on the public finances, at least in the near term, because investment spending is not heavily taxed. In fact, if companies do less investment, they may be paying more in corporation tax. But over the longer run, if we do less investment, there'll be less corporate profits and they would have been subject to tax. So we might think that the composition of the hit to GDP is going to be relatively tax friendly in the short run, 
compared to the long run. And we think that over the longer term, beyond 21-22, um, as the economy adjusts, you might expect an additional effect of Brexit of about three and a half billion pounds a year. Finally, the OBR forecasts do not allow for any one-off divorce settlement with the European Union. So if we do hand over a one-off check to Brussels, that will add to borrowing and debt. But on the other side, they haven't allocated any saving from the £8 billion per year net that we pay into the European Union budget. So at the moment, there's no accounting for the fact that we could choose to not send any money to the European Union each year on an ongoing basis. We could choose to refinance all of the spending that the European Union currently does in the UK on our behalf and have £8 billion a year left over relative to the OBR forecast. So it's not assumed that that will be saved. So what about the new government? What, what's changed since the election? Well, the obvious thing that's changed is we have the confidence and supply arrangement between the Conservatives and the DUP. That's pledged to spend an additional £450 million a year for two years um, in Northern Ireland, the possibility being raised that more will follow after that. I think it's worth saying that's a very significant sum in terms of spending in Northern Ireland. It's a tiny sum for the UK public finances. Um, but of course, if it adds to pressure to spend elsewhere in the, European, in, elsewhere in the UK, um, it would be a, a, a huge amount. So, £450 million is equivalent to 1.3% of the economy in Northern Ireland. If you wanted to boost public spending by that magnitude across the UK, you'd be talking about a two, £22 billion per year giveaway. So this chart here is showing you total public spending as a share of gross value added, a measure of the size of the economy, um, which will be in each part of the UK. You can see that um, the addition of £450 million, basically you can't see what that's adding to the UK number, it's uh, minuscule. If we bring up other parts of the United Kingdom, you can see that Northern Ireland currently, um, as a relatively poor part of the United Kingdom, um, has a very high level of public spending as a share of its economy. And actually, the £450 million addition is not an insignificant amount. It's increasing the size of that bar by a noticeable degree. Another issue that's come up over the last week or so has been on public sector pay. Um, the government currently spends about £180 billion a year, remunerating 5.1 million public sector workers. So that's the cost of pay, the cost of their public service pension contributions, the cost of the employer national insurance levied on their pay. Recent policy has been to squeeze public sector pay scales back, um, and that's been, under current policy, that will continue right through to 2019-20. We could choose to be more generous if we wanted, um, but of course because we spend so much on public sector pay, because it's a large part of what the public sector does, a significant increase would be expensive. So the forecast suggests that if we instead chose to index in line with private sector wage growth, rather than sticking to the 1% a year average increase in pay scales, by 21-22 that would cost about £9 billion a year additional to public spending, unless we decided to pay for it by additional cuts to employment or to non-pay bill spending. Now I think it's worth noting in the near term, some of that additional spending would actually flow back to the Treasury, some of the increase in pension contributions, some of the boost to tax revenues that you'd get. But that would, both of those would unwind over the longer term as the economy adjusts and as your public service pension outgoings start to increase. So why might we be interested in increasing public sector pay? Um, the chart here shows you hourly wages in the public sector relative to hourly wages in the private sector. Now, I don't know what the right level of this chart is. Um, we know, for example, that surgeons are going to be paid more on average than many private sector workers, not least because they have higher levels of education, but how much more, um, we don't know. But we might be interested in the trend over time. And you can see that the squeeze so far on public sector pay could well be justified by the fact that actually we're just unwinding the um, increase in public sector pay relative to private sector pay that occurred um, in the face of the recession and financial crisis. So the relativities are now back to the level they were around the time the crisis hit. If the OBR's forecast for private sector wage growth are correct and we continue increasing pay scales by 1% a year on average, we'll see that the ratio will continue to decline and reach its lowest level since the early 1990s, and there may well be concerns that this will feed into increased pressures, um, increased problems in terms of recruitment and retention of the public sector workers that we want. If instead we move to a world where we index public sector pay scales in line with private sector wages, um, the line would flatten out naturally, and we would, we would only see it reverse back to the level seen 
in the early 2000s rather than driving it back to level C in the early 1990s. So if we do stick to current policy on public sector pay, there's clearly a significant risk that pressures in recruitment and retention will grow and become increasingly problematic for the government. So finally, I want to talk about an end to austerity. What might that look like? There's been a lot of talk about whether we should end austerity. Um, how much might it cost? Well, in part, it depends on what you mean by austerity. So one possibility is you're just interested in public services and you say, well, we don't want to cut public service spending as a share of our economy anymore. Well, if you want to do that, you need to find £17 billion in 2122. Um, you could either tax that much more or you could borrow that much more. Or you could go further. You could say, well, in addition to um, looking at public services, we're also worried about the effect of tax rises and benefit cuts on household incomes. Perhaps we want to cancel all of the tax rises that are in the pipeline, cancel all of the benefit cuts that are working their way through. Well, they were doing that would cost you five and 11 billion pounds, respectively. So if you went for all three, the 33 billion pound giveaway, um, you'd be borrowing more than 2% of GDP in 2020-21, so that target would clearly have to go, and you'd probably have to abandon your commitment to eliminate the deficit by the middle of the next decade. So I can show you the trade-off here. Um, this budget constraint is showing you how much of a loosening you want to go for in 21-22. Do you want to go for no loosening relative to current plans, or do you want to go for something bigger? And what would that mean for the level of debt that we would have in 21-22 as a share of our economy? So on the left-hand side here, I've got a scenario where the Chancellor stood up in his budget, the forecasts haven't changed, he said, I want to do the additional spending in Northern Ireland, I want to do the income tax cuts that I said in my manifesto, and I'm not going to do anything else. So debt would be a little bit higher than the budget forecast because of those two policy measures, it will be slightly just over 80% of GDP. Alternatively, the Chancellor could say, well, I want to maintain public service spending as a share of GDP, and I'm not going to do tax rises or benefit cuts to pay for it, I'm just going to borrow the money, in which case you'd be pushing debt to GDP up to about 81.5%. Or you could say, well, actually, I don't want to do the public service cuts. I also don't want to continue putting up taxes or cutting um, welfare spending. That's a full £33 billion a year giveaway, pushing public sector debt up to 83% by the end of this Parliament. So clearly, you know, Ending austerity has a big trade-off between that and the, the, the kind of what we get to enjoy in terms of services, what we get to do in terms of supporting household incomes, and how much government debt we're comfortably have, comfortable with having at the end of this parliament. So to conclude, um, there's been terrible economic growth in the UK since the start of 2008. Um, that's what's been driving the challenges for household finances, for the government's finances. And despite this, the OBR is now judging that there's no spare capacity in the economy. So the deficit we have, um, if we want to reduce it, is going to need further tax rises or spending cuts to bring it down. We can't sit back and rely on the fruits of economic growth to reduce it naturally. The budget plans imply a considerable fiscal tightening over the next few years, net tax rises, cuts to benefits working their way through the pipeline, and further cuts to spending on public services as a share of national income. And even if we keep to this plan, eliminating the deficit by the mid-2020s will be far from easy. But we do have a choice. The deficit's now back to pre-crisis levels, just under 2.5% of GDP. The UK could choose to live with that level of deficit on an ongoing basis. That's an option available to us. That was not an option in 2010. We could not have sustained a deficit north of 9% of GDP every year forevermore. So we could choose to go for no more deficit reduction if we want. That would require a sizable giveaway relative to current plans, better public services, more support for household incomes, but it would mean greater government debt, and it would also mean, almost certainly, yet another relaxing of the government's fiscal targets. Thank you.